Father, we thank you for the chance to look at your word, and I pray that this month, as, as in all months, Father, I pray that you would help us to see your word with, with new eyes, that we would see the, the interesting details that are in there, the exciting stories, maybe things that are, that are different that we hadn't paid attention to before, Father, but help us to develop within ourselves a love for your word. That we would be hungry to know what you have said in, in, these, in these stories and the messages that you have for us, even from these stories that happened so long ago. Thank you, Father, for your word this morning. And I pray that it is your word that we hear and not me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so this month we're going to look at creepy stories from the Bible. And this theme is based on the fact that it's October and everybody's kind of moving towards Halloween and all the TV shows are all getting kind of weird this month and everything. So we're going to we're gonna do some weird stuff uh, in, sept in, in October. Uh, but I think that you're going to see that this is a lot of fun too. There are some stories we're going to talk about, including the one today, that's kind of a lesser taught story. It's not really one that we talk a lot about in the Bible classes, um, but, but we're going to talk about it today. Uh, how many, before I get in there, though, how many of you have ever watched the show Supernatural? Raise your hand. Come on, raise it high. I want to see you. Super, oh, I got, I got, do now you watch Supernatural? Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually find the show very fascinating. It's, uh, there's a lot of biblical references in there. Um, but interesting thing, there are so many people that Supernatural is their understanding of the the, the stories of God and Jesus and the Bible and the de demons and angels and all these things. I had a young man tell me one time, 12 year old, tell me one time that he thought that, that the devil's name was Crowley. Okay, and that God had a sister. And he, and he learned all these things from supernatural. And so there's cer certain things that we learn from our culture around. And there's some stories that are in the Bible that we completely overlook. Because they're weird or they're not, they're not the normal thing. But there's a lot of people today that are moving towards what we would consider occult-like uh, belief systems. Things that aren't really scripture, they're different. But then there are things that we hold to that may or may not be as accurate as we thought they are. There, there's a story I want to talk about today that uh, kind of gets on the fringes of some things that we, that we teach even our kids. Um, it's kind of what I would call a ghost story. And, uh, and I want to share this with you today. Today, if you want to turn your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28, the Philistines are coming in, and they're, they're about to invade, and, and there's a lot, of, a lot of tension going on. And beginning in verse, 20, in verse 3, it says, Now Samuel, Samuel's the prophet of God. Samuel's the prophet that anointed Saul. Samuel's the prophet that anointed David. Now Samuel had died. And all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. Mediums and necromancers are in the Bible? What is this? Necromancers, aren't those the ones that can raise the dead? Mm -hmm. Okay. These are people that Saul has put out of the land. Now, when I think about this passage, I, I need to tell you, this is important this verse is important because this isn't the first time that the Bible has talked about these people. Okay, In Leviticus chapter 19, uh, Moses says this, Do not turn to the mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. In the very next chapter, he says again, he says, If a person turns to mediums and necromancers, pouring after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. You think God wanted the people to stay away from those people? Later on in that very same chapter, he says, anyone who seeks them out should be stoned to death. Okay? In Deuteronomy chapter 18, um, ver verses 10, and 12, 10 through 12, it says, There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. There's a lot of things that you read about in the Old Testament that are abominations to the Lord. And there's a lot of discussions about a lot of those things these days. Okay, um, But here's a whole list of, of people that we would consider uh, associated with occult-like practices. And in and, and Deuteronomy, it says those, those, those people are an abomination before the Lord. Now, the people themselves, God wants them to come to know him. But the, what they're doing is, is a 
abominable. These are the abominable necromancers, the abominable mediums. Okay, they're not snowmen. Um, every time I think of the word abominable, all I can think about is a snowman. Um, but uh, in, in Isaiah chapter eight, he explains why. Okay, in Isaiah chapter eight, verse nineteen, he says, "And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not people inquire of their God?" Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? And yet that's what we're going to see in this story. Many of you in your Bibles, you have a heading over the story. And it, and it talks about uh, the, a witch. Uh, and, and we're going to show you this in just a minute. So we've got the Philistines coming in. And in verse 5, it says, When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Where's Saul's trust at this time? Saul's trust is within himself and with his, within his armies. He's already turned away from the Lord. The Holy Spirit has already left Saul. And so now he's, he's relying on his own self. And he is at the end of his reign. This is the time where he has already tried to kill David. David's fled. Now David's kind of working in his armies in a different way. And there's all this stuff going on here. There, and, and the kingdom is being taken away from Saul. And now Saul's afraid of these Philistines. These are the very same Philistines that David rose up and slew the giants before just not very long before this okay same army but now Saul's afraid and so what he does uh, is he goes to God and it says when Saul inquired of the Lord the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets um, God didn't come to him in a dream by the Urim this is an interesting concept that we have really no idea what this means uh, very likely Urim was something they would use as a way of what we call casting lots or rolling the dice, doing some kind of other chance kind of game. So, so they would they would give give a, a couple options here, and however the dice would roll, that was how the how God would choose for them. We would very likely not roll some dice to decide whether we would move here or move there. We would probably make a list, right? We'd make a list of pros and cons of each place, and then we logically work it out. They just, you know, let's roll some dice, and God will make the dice land as they lay. That's a lot of faith there. So he so he, he went to God. God didn't answer him by dreams. He didn't answer him by Urim. He seeks out the prophets. None of the prophets have a word from the Lord, from the Lord for Saul. And so what does he do? He says, I'm going to go find me a medium or a necromancer. Let's go find a medium. So he says, hey, does anybody know where there's a medium? And this one lady says, I know where there is this medium, or if you have a King James Version, the witch, okay, in indoor. Some of you, when I said indoor, you immediately thought of this. <laughs> Every time I read the story about the witch of indoor, I can't help but think about Ewoks and the Return of the Jedi. Because that's the forest of Endor right there. And so uh, every time I get distracted by, by Ewoks when I read the story. But she's, she's, from the, she's from Endor. I'm pretty sure she's not an Ewok. Um, but he goes to see her. Now remember, what had Saul already done with all the, the mediums and the necromancers? He sent them all away, right? So now the king goes with two other people next to him. And, and he, he, he kind of cloaks himself, puts a hood on goes in there and says, hey, I need you to find somebody. And she says, whoa, wait a minute. The king's already decreed I'm not supposed to do this stuff anymore. He said, well, do it anyways. I'll make sure you're safe. So she seeks after the dead, and she says, now, who is it that you want to, uh, who is it you want to find? He says, bring up Samuel. Remember the one who's dead back in verse 3? Bring up Samuel. So she Whatever she does with her little seance thing there, I don't know what it looked like. Samuel shows up. Samuel shows up. Now this goes against some of our theology. It goes against some of our traditional beliefs in how the dead and living communicate and all this kind of stuff and whether or not some of that occult stuff is real. Okay, This medium goes after Samuel and finds him. She screams... Saul says, who did you see? She said, it's this old dude in a robe. Go back and read it. It's in there. It's an old guy in a robe. He says, oh, that's Samuel. <laughs> My favorite verse, maybe right after the verse where what, what Samson said about them following with his heifer, okay, is this verse. Samuel's response. 
Samuel's response right here is classic. Okay? In, in, uh, in, in 1 Samuel 28, Samuel is raised up at, by this medium and he says, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Nobody's like him. <laughs> Can you imagine? Samuel is frustrated here. You guys are messing with my slumber here. I'm in rest. And you're, you're disturbing me? And, and of course the medium screamed, right? But to me, this is comical. He gets back from being dead, and he goes, who's disturbing me and why? It's comical to me. Maybe it's not to you guys. It's funny to me. Whatever. Um, but uh, so, so Saul says, I haven't heard a word from the Lord. I need you to give me some advice here on what to do about the Philistine. So Samuel says to him, why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? Ouch. God is now Saul's enemy. The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Now, of all the people for Saul to inquire of, Samuel has already prophesied against Saul while, Saul, while Samuel was still living. Okay? Go back and read that story. Samuel told Saul, you turned away from the Lord. God's taken the kingdom out of your hand. You're going to fall by the sword. You and your whole family are going to fall by the sword. And God's going to give it to David. So he says, look, it's exactly what I said to you when I was still living. He goes on, though. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Dead Samuel said that. Tomorrow, you're going to be with me. How do you think Saul felt at that point? He was afraid before he went to see Samuel. <laughs> He's probably terrified now. In fact, he was so scared, he couldn't hardly eat. He was laying down. They had to convince him to lay down on the bed, eat a little bit. The, the witch goes and kills a fattened calf and comes back in, makes him some dinner. And finally, after he eats, then they leave. And guess what happened the next day? The next day, they're fighting against the Philistines. And the Philistines kill all of Saul's sons, including Jonathan. This is in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 31. Kill all of his sons. And then he gets all lit up with arrows. So now he's wounded really bad. And he tells his servant, run my sword through me. And his servant says, I'm not going to do that. So Saul falls on his own sword and dies. And then the servant looks around and realizes he's fixing to die too. So he falls on his own sword. And in 1 Samuel chapter 31, all Saul and his sons and all his servants, they all die in the same day. And Israel falls to the Philistines. 1 Chronicles chapter 10 sums it up like this. So because Saul died for his, so Saul died for his breach of faith, he broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Why did Saul die? Because he did not seek guidance from the Lord. He thought he could find advice from any and everywhere. He'd already turned his back on God. And then, very much like people today, he turned his back on God and said, Well, why isn't God acting? Why isn't God answering my prayers? Do you guys get that? Sometimes we only want to go to God whenever it's convenient for us to do so. We live like the world, and then we expect God to be our holy Santa Claus, bending and, and, and turning at every beck and call, giving us whatever we ask for. If you don't have a relationship with God, you don't have a relationship with God. You don't get the right to come before his throne and beseech him with requests. Does it work that way? In fact, Isaiah 61 said, your sins have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. 
Now, Jesus can make everything right for those who turn themselves away from God. Jesus can make that right again. But we can't expect to live, however, to turn our back on God with our lives of sin and then expect to come to God and he just automatically caves to whatever we ask for. Saul had gone to God. God wasn't listening. God wasn't asking, answering. So what did Saul do? He went to other, much more evil ways that Saul knew were listed as abominations before the Lord. And he sought out those ways. And that didn't work either. Let me tell you, church, if you want to find guidance from other places other than God and his scriptures, if you want to find guidance elsewhere in some of these mediums of the world, whatever, you're not going to find what you're looking for. You're not going to find the kind of life you desire. You're not going to find the kind of hope that you need. You're not going to find the salvation that you crave. You'll only find that through Jesus. So looking at this story. I have three things I want you to get out of the story with this crazy ghost dead Samuel showing up. First thing is this. Leviticus isn't our law. We're not held to the old covenant, the old law, the old testament. We're, we're under the new covenant of, of, of love and grace through Jesus. However, the command still holds true for us that we are to seek guidance from the Lord. That's still true for us. Okay? Your friend who doesn't have any relationship with Jesus can't give you nearly as good advice as God can. Okay? The second thing goes right in hand with this. When God isn't answering your prayers concerning a decision, it may not be the right time to make that decision. It's kind of like when you go to a car dealer. Not that we have any car dealers in here or anything. It's kind of like when you go, it's kind of like when you go to a car dealer. And I'm not talking about Robert. Robert's pretty laid back. But uh, sometimes you go there and they're like, oh, we got this car in today, but we got to get it sold by like 3 o'clock this afternoon. you got to make this decision right now. And there's this pressure. Anybody ever felt that pressure of buying a car or buying a house or buying toothpaste? I don't know. Um, <laughs> got to have it right now. You know, got to have that decision right now. Look, when you feel that pressure back away, you're not in the right mind to make that decision. Jesus said, I can do nothing without the Father. You guys catch that? I can do nothing without the Father. So what decision should you make without prayer? None. Jesus didn't find it. He didn't find himself good enough to make decisions without prayer. How arrogant is it for us to decide that we can do any kind of decision making without prayer? <laughs> So when God isn't answering your prayers, maybe you should wait until you know. Okay? The third thing, and this is the last thing, and then we'll be done this morning. The third thing is this. God is still the best source of guidance. How many of you have ever gotten advice from your friend, and they didn't turn out to be the best advice? Anybody in here? Okay, there's like a handful there, and then there's like us. That's it. You know? Yeah, okay. Some of you are just hesitant to hold your hand up. I know how to do it. Okay? You got advice. It wasn't the best advice. You know why? Because they're flawed human beings. Who created you? God created you. Who has the plan for you? God does. Who has a promise for you? God does. Who is it that can transform you from the inside out because he created you the first time? Only God can. And so when we start looking to the world, to our friends, our co-workers, to Jerry Springer, we start looking all kinds of ways for advice on how we should live our lives. Guess what? Our lives are going to start spiraling out of control. And then we wonder, what happened? We didn't go to the best source of guidance. God is still the best source of guidance. And we can still find his word right here. And we can still go to him in prayer. And those who have a relationship with God, he still answers. He answers our prayers all the time. And many of you in here today are proof of that. Earlier today, Mel had to leave, but earlier today when Mel was here, he is proof that God answers prayers. <laughs> J.M. is proof that God answers prayers. 
be honest with you, I am proof that God answers prayers. And you probably are too. So let's rely on him. So this month, we're going to continue looking at some weird stories from the Bible. And, and we're going to see some fun things, we're going to see some funny things, and we're going to see some things that go, really, that happened? But all of those things are in there. And what I want you to hear last of all, is if you didn't know that Saul brought Samuel back from the dead to get advice, bad advice, by the way, if you didn't know that happened, maybe it's time you should get in there and look at this book. There's some really cool stuff in there that you hadn't even paid attention to. There's things in here that make that show supernatural look really silly. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you that you do hear our prayers and you answer them. I thank you, Father, that you have shown us the way. And I pray that you would help us to follow in your ways. Help us not to fall into the temptation of trying to find our guidance from our friends and our relatives, Father, but help us to seek after your will and to seek others who are seeking after your will, Father. We thank you that you allow us to come into your presence in prayer. We thank you that you've called us your children and that you've promised to never leave us or forsake us. And Father, we thank you for your word, your Bible, that uh, is full of all kinds of really interesting stories. And I pray that you help us to grow as we explore your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you don't have a relationship.